Our next guest, Amanda Roman. Amanda is a bold change maker with over two decades of leadership experience bridging divides, identifying common ground, and elevating the voices of others to make a difference in the world. She's a transpartisan thought leader and strategist. The specialty is empowerment coaching for individuals, teams, and executives that catalyzes the discovery of strengths, the integration of personal development, and an increased capacity to learn new skills to turn passion into action for lasting impact. Her passionate pursuit of service has led to innovations and game-changing results for Living Room Conversations, Democracy Cafe, Bridge Alliance, Republican National Committee, Tipping Point Network, Americans for Tax Reform, Healthy Democracy, Reason Foundation, and Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy, among others. Ladies and gentlemen, Amanda Roman. Hello, and thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and speak with everyone about the Living Room Conversations Project, something that I am very passionate about and hope that after getting a glimpse of what one looks like and me explaining to you a little bit of how the project got started and how you can get involved to make a difference in your community, you will be just as passionate about this opportunity as I am. Here at Living Room Conversations, our vision is a world in which people that have fundamental differences of opinion and backgrounds can really come together and work together with respect and sometimes even joy to realize the vibrant future that we all desire. So Living Room Conversations was designed by a team of transpartisan colleagues that I was honored to be a part of. Uh, we were an initiative called Changing the Game. And what we did with the initial pilot project for Living Room Conversations was have a goal to design a dialogue that would intentionally bring people together that had different points of view. And this was something that uh, is challenging in and of itself, but we chose to throw an additional curveball in there and have them talk about hot button political issues. So it was a little bit of a crazy idea, but we like doing bold game changing things. And so what we had seen uh, the members of this design team is that this intense hyper partisanship was literally paralyzing our country and it was um, making it uh, impossible to really get anything done and move forward as a, uh, a country on a, a number of very important issues. And so what we did is put on a pilot project that we had take place in a number of different states. Um, and the foundation of this was really the ground rules. And so since this is a conference learning about the how to, uh, to be successful with game changing uh, political advocacy and activism, um, I think this is something that's very important to underscore. Um, the foundation of the project and the conversations themselves that you just saw take place over your intermission are the following ground rules. And I'm going to read these to you because they're very important. Um, the first is to be curious and open to learning. So what that really means is just to be to listen and to be open to hearing all different points of view. The second is to show respect and suspend judgment. Um, so really, this is an effort to do your best not to judge. The third ground rule is to actively be looking for common ground. And this is something that uh, oftentimes surprises people when they participate in a living room conversation that there is so much common ground. But you're basically looking for places where all the parties agree and you're able to appreciate that there are disagreements that are going to take place. The fourth one is to be authentic and to welcome that from others. Um, what, is, what is key to a living room conversation is that you are able to share what's important and meaningful to you and understand that everyone else that's participating is doing the same. The fifth is to be purposeful and to the point. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. And then the sixth is to own and guide the conversation. So it's important to take responsibility for the quality of the participation. Uh, one of the things that was important to us when we started Living Room Conversations is that we made this an open source project so that you could literally pick it up as an average everyday American and really make a difference in your community. And so that is part of the self-moderation that takes place with these guidelines that we put in place with the, with the uh, ground rules that I just read. Now, I'm a mom to three small little kids, and if I really look at and boil down what those ground rules are, those are really things that I try to teach my kids on a daily basis. And so in some ways, it's a sorry reflection on the state of uh, where we are with our political systems, that we need to state ground rules that really relate to uh, mutual respect 
and curiosity and learning about other people that are different from us. But those ground rules are extremely important. And what we have found is that when they are put in place with groups of people that have those differing points of view and are brought together to discuss something that is typically a hot button issue, um, those ground rules really create a, a safe, comfortable space for a real conversation and a discussion to take place. So what we learned after this pilot project um, was essentially what we had hypothesized from the beginning, that everyday Americans like building relationships with people that they might not agree with on every issue, and that they wanted to feel safe and heard when they expressed those, but also the fact that their core belief system, whatever that may be, was heard and respected at the same time. Again, the ground rules uh, come into play for that to take place. And then the third thing, which was really key, and it's something that I use in all of the coaching that um, I provide in um, other projects that I uh, participate in in the transpartisan movement, is that when you're able to break bread together, even if it's just over brownies and lemonade or um, some type of food that you're able to share together as a group, um, and especially in an intimate setting like a living room, it makes a huge difference on the quality of relationship that you build because you're starting from something that um, we all need. We all need to be nourished, um, you know, our physical bodies with food and also um, our, our minds and our souls with good conversation and, um, you know, healthy, positive um, reading. So many of you are probably familiar with Joan Blades, the co-founder of the progressive activist movement Move On and the women's group Moms Rising. She's also the co-author of The Custom Fit Workplace. And she's a mom. She's a mentor, and she's also my friend. Uh, we both love the great outdoors. We both love chocolate. Um, but there are lots of other things that we don't agree on when it comes to policy issues. Um, but Joan is a dear friend of mine who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Um, you may not have heard of me, but you're probably familiar with a lot of the projects and work that I have done over the years. And unlike Joan, I grew up in a community in community organizing and grassroots politics from the center right conservative political point of view. Um, I was very fortunate in my career to have spent time in Washington, D.C. for about a decade. Um, I had uh, the opportunity to do really amazing things like eat in the White House dining room with um, President Bush's very high ranking officials. Um, I spoke at uh, numerous conferences and had an opportunity to interact with uh, President Bush over multiple occasions. He was a keynote at a variety of the um, events that I put on in Washington, D.C. And I worked very closely with Grover Norquist, the president of Americans for Tax Reform, best known for the Taxpayer Protection Pledge, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And I really built his um, statewide um, uh uh, statewide advocacy groups, I'm sorry, throughout the country. So you, you see, Joan and I have very different backgrounds, um, but our activism and our involvement has really shown that we care about our country and our communities, and we find, want to find ways to elevate the voices of other people and bring them together to create healthier, more sustainable communities overall, um, which is very important to our democracy. So over the past eight years, Personally, I've been very dedicated to the transpartisan movement. And the transpartisan movement, if that's something that you're not familiar with, is basically one that honors the wisdom and diversity and seeks to bridge differences and provide opportunities for collaborative action. So I have had the opportunity of building out two different transpartisan organizations and to serve various initiatives and projects. Living Room Conversations is the one that I'm perhaps the most proud of. Uh, Joan and I partnered to launch livingroomconversations.org, and we both knew in our hearts and from our firsthand experiences that were mired in this hyper-partisan situation that our family and our friends and our neighbors and even our professional colleagues were really yearning for a way to talk to one another without the barriers that are imposed by what our political system has become. So it was important to us as individuals, and we knew that it was necessary for our communities and our country. I'm sure that many of you participating in this conference also feel the same way. So Living Room Conversations is designed to really help participants understand each other and the differing points of view. Um, our tagline, which you, if you've had a chance to look at our website, you'll see in our logo, is open your ears, open your mind, and open your home. I am confident that if you do this as a participant in a living room conversation following those ground rules that I reviewed in the beginning, you will experience something that is literally life-changing. What you just saw during the break 
was an experiment. It was the first online living room conversation. So clearly there are a lot of differences between an online interaction and something that takes place in person, but there are also a lot of similarities. Uh, the online format of living room conversations is something that we'll continue to work on honing, and we'd love to hear any suggestions that you might have um, if you did watch the last living room conversation here about freedom. So due to time constraints, some of the things that were different uh, were, were structural changes um, that you didn't see the reading of the ground rules in the beginning. And you might not have heard all of the um, banter back and forth that was kind of friendly um, between the participants because we were trying to give you the meat of the conversation. Um, but each participant in a living room conversation will come to the table, so to speak, um, committed to listening and holding that tension of differences. Um, many people that in the feedback loop have reported to us that they actually developed new skills after participating in a living room conversation because this was a setting that they had not had the opportunity to participate in before. Um, and as you heard, um, at the end of this online living room conversation, I think every single participant said that they were interested in bringing this format and this opportunity to people in their communities. So I hope that many of you will do the same in your community. I led a number of living room conversations when I was living in California, um, and we had a uh, amazing experience, and it's something that was really eye-opening for me, um, coming from a design standpoint to a founder standpoint to actually participating and leading a living room conversation. It was incredibly gratifying. So I encourage everyone to go to livingroomconversations.org to find out more information. Um, but I do want to give you um, some very specifics on how the living room conversation actually works. We tried to highlight that in the clip that you just saw. But again, due to time constraints, we weren't able to go into all of the detail. Um, so as you know, um, Americans all across the country are really sick of the status quo. And technology has provided us so many opportunities to raise the voices of average Americans, um, everyday folks that might not be a leader of an organization, but are very dedicated to their communities. Uh, think of examples like YouTube and Wikipedia. So again, Living Room Conversations was designed as open source. So while we have a lot of materials on the website, um, over 22 different topics um, we have guidelines for, uh, we encourage you to kind of take it and make it work for your community um, and for the issue that you want to talk about. So Living Room Conversations is one initiative, as I mentioned, within the larger transpartisan um, movement that is uh, aimed at um, providing these opportunities for bridging divides. And uh, it's part of a larger uh, organization that's emerging, which you may want to keep an eye on, called the Bridge Alliance. Um, and that's an organization that is actually working to weave these initiatives and organizations together. So I would encourage you to check out uh, the Bridge Alliance as well. So let's get down to it. How does a living room conversation work? The first step is that two friends who have differing points of view decide to co-host a living room conversation. Um, as I mentioned, they go to the website, they can download the free materials on a wide variety of issues, and then they decide on who is going to host the conversation at their home. They then each invite two friends that have uh, a viewpoint that's similar to theirs, but it might be a different shade um, of their political perspective, so that we have a, a difference of opinions in the participants. Um, basically then what happens on the night of the conversation is everyone comes together, there's an opportunity, as I mentioned, to break bread and get to know each other a little bit casually over some food and drink. And then the living room conversation kicks off. The first step that people take is to read the ground rules, which we reviewed earlier. This is a great way to ground the conversation and remind everyone that even though it might be a little bit scary to be going into a conversation like this, um, that everyone is committed to doing it in a respectful way. Um, and reading the ground rules aloud also reminds everyone that they're there to kind of self-moderate if it happens to get a little bit off course um, when the topic gets um, discussed. We provide a lot of uh, troubleshooting tips as well um, for that on the website. Um, and then the living room conversation consists of five rounds of questions and the, then there's a closing session. And throughout those rounds, uh, the individuals that are participating are provided with questions that are very specifically worded and designed to bring out what people's individual beliefs are, um, but also provide the space for a wide variety of different points of view to be showcased as well. So I won't read each question for the rounds, but I'll give you kind of the themes for each round so you can imagine what it looks like in a full out living room conversation um, where you saw a bit of an abbreviated one here in the live uh, online version. 
So the first round is really focused on getting started. Why are you here? So we give people opportunities to talk about what makes them tick, what their very deeply held um, beliefs are on, on the issue that they're talking about, and why that's the case. Um, many times this humanizes the experience for people because they realize that the reason someone holds a particular view is due to a very personal experience they had, oftentimes something that someone else in the group can relate to. Round two focuses on hopes and concerns for the future. So while your belief might be informed by an experience that you had, um, your hopes and dreams for the future relate to what you see um, you know, as currently happening and the place for you and your family and your community um, in the future. And so that's a really important way of framing the conversation as well. So round three gets into a little bit more of the topic specific conversation. Um, we talk about the biggest concerns that an individual has around that topic area that's been selected. And then we go into round four, which is what we are learning um, as we are interacting with each other and learning about concerns and challenges. And then at the end, um, the closing really relates to um, uh, what the accomplishments are that you saw as taking place as a participant in the conversation and what next steps the group might want to take together. When we design the living room conversations, um, we did not intend or require that participants are required to work together on something afterwards. However, after holding hundreds of these throughout the country, it was very nice to see a lot of collaborative action and collective um, working together come out of a, a conversation that took place within this format. So the goals of a living room conversation are to build relationships with people that have different points of view, to increase trust with one another, and to build relationships that those collaborations are actually possible for problem solving. And finally, to find and share win-win, or we like to say 100 or 80% agreement on solutions. So the guides, as I said, are free and available online. And I hope that many people will take the opportunity to host a living room conversation. I'm going to be available for some questions that people might have specifically on the program. But I really would like to close in saying that it's really time for us to turn our di diverse viewpoints um, into assets instead of viewing them as something that can tear us apart. Um, I think I believe very much in the wisdom and diversity. And I think that when people get together in a setting where they respect one another and can understand where someone is coming from, new solutions and new ideas emerge that just wouldn't have been possible under the confines of uh, the way that our system was was set up and, and the dysfunction that has taken place um, in our political systems. So I am very proud to be a part of the Living Room Conversations and the Bridge Alliance and the broader transpartisan movement. And we're actively creating opportunities to work together off, off, uh, across political and cultural divides. And I invite you to join me in that process. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And we do have some questions for you, and we really appreciate you coming on to ACON3, especially, uh, you know, that we were able to connect just before the event was happening, and I appreciate you making the time. We all do appreciate you making the time. Thank you so much. I, what you were talking about, and, and, and as you actually read at the end of your presentation, you had mentioned it, and someplace I wanted to go, you, you had talked about people working together or not, or not being a requirement from the living room conversation, and you mentioned that you had seen it happen. Why don't you talk a little bit more about that, how well it has been successful, and, and give an example of what, what you can say from, uh, I guess, the greatest divide that you've seen come together and actually go forward, whether it was on a single issue or just working uh, you know, for the greater good for our audience, please. Sure, I can give two, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll shorten the uh, examples, but one was the off of the living room conversation that I held. I lived in Northern California for a time being, and off of the living room conversation that I held, um, we did not necessarily come together on a specific issue, but what ended up happening was we had regular occurring meetings that I moderated between the Republican elected officials and the Democratic elected officials in someone's home where we had a potluck and um, every time that we gathered and it was sometimes it was a structured conversation and sometimes it was just opportunities to get to know one another better. And there were a, numer a number of issues that um, were very challenging for the leadership, the elected leadership in the community that were really diffused because people got to know each other on a regular basis. So that's kind of a broader um, picture relationship building that there were um, numerous um, things that just were not as divisive and people were able to have more 
um, genuine, open, respectful conversations in our community. So that's, that's kind of on one level. And then on another level, um, I think perhaps the most illustrative um, example for an issue based is around criminal justice reform. Uh, we did a series of criminal justice reform conversations in different parts of the country and ended up getting um, some more high level participants from um, more conservative and progressive leaning um, uh, points of view come together. And there is a lot of uh, synergy on different things that can be uh, reformed within our criminal justice system. And so people like Van Jones and Newt Gingrich and Grover Norquist and Joan Blades are coming together to talk about um, how can we take the collective uh, power of the movements that we're involved in and that we lead um, to do something on a large scale with this criminal justice reform um, aspect. And so um, there have been large scale conversations, there have been um, private conversations, there have been uh, regional conversations in different parts of the country. And there's a lot of um, movement on this issue. And so I think that's um, something particularly with um, some of the, the recent you know, news events um, around um, the, the justice system in different parts of the East Coast and, and the Midwest, um, something that is obviously a very hot button issue. Um, and Living Room Conversations provided a great uh, launching point for that to move into more of a national um, kind of action taking opportunity. Fantastic. And you actually opened up another door that I wanted to go through as well, dealing with the elected officials. And obviously you've had some successes there. From the standpoint of talking to activists, using Living Room Conversation, you provide tools. You've mentioned that. Do you provide a tool that is a direction to get access to the high ranking officials or the elected officials in the room the way you guys did? Obviously, you have a lot of experience and you, your doors are open to you. How do you provide information or what can you say to our activists about getting conversations with the, the elected officials and high ranking officials that deal with issues? Sure. Well, I would say, and I will um, in all honesty say that I am a grassroots girl at heart. I got started in grassroots community organizing at the age of 11. Um, and sure. while I worked at the, the very high levels at the, at the national level in, in a very intimate way, um, I very firmly believe in um, the power of grassroots and the power of everyday Americans. And so what, what actually took place, even with the networks that people like Joan or I have access to, is these conversations were taking place just between, you know, normal people like, uh, you know, that, that are in your neighborhood. You know, I don't know if normal is the best word, but, you know, everyday folks that don't yeah, necessarily have a larger that. platform. And it was the um, opposing viewpoints that they went into it and the successes in yeah, pointing out where there back. is common ground that actually what I see in not just living room conversations, but a lot of the initiatives that I work on that gets, uh, that gets elected officials to pay attention to what is going on and what the possibilities are. I think oftentimes um, elected officials, and, and I've worked with them at all different levels, um, get caught up in the dysfunction of the system and sometimes cannot see as clearly because they have all of these other competing interests. And when folks can bring a solution that has common ground identified that's pretty common sense, that works for a wide majority of people, um, that's what actually triggers them into paying attention. So I would actually encourage people to um, do living room conversations and these types of actions in their community and find ways to demonstrate what is coming out of them. And, and that's why I mentioned technology earlier, um, you know, with the growth of new media and all of the access um, to tools that we have now um, with the, the Internet, uh, that's something that you can publicize in, in ways that you couldn't 10 years ago. Um, even five years ago, you know, new technologies have emerged. So I would actually encourage you to um, use uh, living room conversations and initiatives like this to gather um, the power of the people um, and showcase that to those that are in elected positions, um, not in an adversarial way, but in a way of saying, hey, look, we got together. Um, these solutions, you know, came up. This is what we think might work. Um, and we'd like to talk with you about them more. Um, it's, it's oftentimes something that we forget as activists sometimes is that regardless of what you might think of a political um, elected official's point of view on an issue, even if you vehemently dis disagree with them, they are inundated with um, a lot of stress and a lot of challenges in their daily um, lives. Another initiative that I work on is focused in urban areas in New Jersey, and there's no money, there's no staff, there's no technology. Um, and regardless of what you might think of those people in those offices um, that, are, that are serving those elected officials very directly, 
they have so much going on that there's no way they could develop solutions for all of the challenges that we have, particularly in um, urban areas and just in a globalized world that we're living in. So I would encourage you to also present those solutions and ideas in a way that is positive with kind of a handout that, hey, let's try and do this together in the same spirit of the Living Room Conversations project. Amanda, thank you so much. That was fantastic and great presentation and really, really appreciate we really appreciate you participating in ActCon 3, and we look forward to working with you in the future. And please call upon us anytime. And, and again, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you. And I hope everyone will check out livingroomconversations.org. Enjoy the rest of your day.